there's all kinds of reasons why you should plein air paint. Some of them very frustrating, and so planning a plein air still life is going to help you kind of control some of the variables so that you can paint with a little more confidence. Okay, so here is my setup, and like I said, I've got my, I'm in my backyard. Um, I've got some zinnia over there. I grow zinnia from my dad's seeds every year, and there's some zinnia and some sunflowers, and it's in a glass vase with a little cut of watermelon, one of my favorite things to include, um, inspired by Sergey Bonegard, who would use it in his still lifes as well. Now, why so, do you have, I, have, I see two still life paintings set up. Why do you have another one off to the side? Well, this is a tiny little uh, sketch that I started just because I knew I'd be doing this demo and I thought I would get some of my um, compositional elements and colors sort of pre-mixed. Um, you can't see a whole lot of my palette, but since this is a, a fast demo, I have sort of pre-mixed piles of color. I'm using uh, Michael Harding paint. You can see I love them. How squeezed up they are. I've got it. That's going to get replaced soon. That's some lemon yellow. And um, yeah, I just, when I'm doing a demo, I like to get uh, all my ducks in a row so that I don't embarrass myself and do a well, bad you're painting. A pro. What, I, what I really <laughs> wanted to know is I see two vases on the table, two different still lights oh, set up, one with an orange yeah. and one with a watermelon. I'm just curious about that. Oh, that's funny. Okay, so, um, you know, because of the, where the camera is set, you're getting sort of this other still life, and that was sort of where I had all my flowers that I was pulling from in order to make this still life. Ah, and this is, okay. This is the okay. one that we're going to do. This is my little sketch of it, and I'm going to do a little 8x8, eight eight, which is kind of a small piece, but that will, um, I can get through a lot more that way, I think, doing a all small right. thing. Okay. Yeah. Y'all ready? You were ready. All right. Okay, so I have got a little uh, kind of a blue-green using sap green and um, ultramarine blue. And I am just going to sort of put in this sort of diagonal of the table and give myself something to pull out of. And I'm sort of defining even that whole back area. Yep. And then since there's so much green in my still life, I can go ahead and pull down some of that information into what the glass vase is going to be. So this is um, transparent colors. Um, sap green and ultramarine blue are both transparent colors. And um, I like having my darks and transparent colors because it, it, it can follow through all the way to the end of the painting so that there's interest in the paint from thin to thick um, right from the very beginning. All right, so I want us to be thinking about um, shape and color, not petals, not glass, not stems, not watermelon. And one of the ways that we artists do that is by squinting down. And so I have a nice big pile of this warm, warm yellow already mixed up. And I'm going to just squint and look at the shape of that um, sunflower. The nice thing about sunflowers is that it's really easy to not think petal because there's so much mass. It's not like a little daisy or even a dogwood where you see um, four or seven petals, but you really can see a nice big mass of yellow. And then over here, sticking outside of my pot, is another big shape of yellow. So, all right, so see, big brush, this is the hog bristle, rosemary number eight, ultimate filbert, and I have just already marked down two big shapes. I'm going to go to another um, hog bristle brush. Look at that. Um, it's one of my dad's zinnias. Make a nice warm red. I'm squinting down and looking at the shape and where it is in relationship to what I've already put in. So when you set up an outdoor still life, you get to be more in control of the elements of that still life. 
um, where it's placed, what the composition is, as opposed to walking out into a scene in nature and feeling, you guys know, you feel overwhelmed. What do I paint? How do I limit it? What do I, how do I compose it? So this is a way to kind of um, be a little more in control. All right, now I'm going to look at this watermelon. I'm squinting down, and there's sort of a shadow side of the watermelon. And it's, it's sort of kissing the glass over here. It's overlapping a little bit. And all I'm thinking is shape. And then there's a light side. I'm going to warm that up. Two yellow. Notice how Susie is doing test shots. She'll just lay down a little tiny bit before she completes it. Exactly. Yeah, and I've, I've taken some workshops. There's some really great painters, and very seldom do you see somebody just sort of nail the color the first off. You know, we're constantly sort of adjusting the hue, which is the, the basic color of the thing. We're adjusting the value, how light or dark that thing is. We're adjusting the saturation, how intense um, or gray that thing is. That's color in a nutshell right there. In a nutshell. In a nutshell. We need more nutshells so we can understand things. Okay, and I see this rind sort of goes into shadow over here. So I'm going to go ahead and shift it. And then when it, when it turns under, it gets quite a bit darker in value. And I'm just looking at shapes, just looking at shapes. You know, it sounds so simple when you say, you know, you just got to find the right shape in the right color in the right place. And that's painting. Same simple, right? <laughs> Well, it does help a lot. You know, I was with some painters this weekend, and I kept saying, there were a couple of newbies, and I kept saying, big shapes, just do big yes. shapes, because they want to put the every leaf on the tree first before laying in a foundation. Yeah, no, 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 don't do that. Do the, um, you know, big, big shapes. So here's my, again, in a nutshell, you go big brush to little brush, big shape to little shape general to specific. Um, you know, like there are highlights and nice little pings on this glass and that will be the thing that really defines the, that that is glass, but it doesn't come until the very end. And we have to sort of save ourselves, you know, hold back on those things. All right, so now I'm looking at, so like I said, you know, students will say, oh, I don't know how to paint glass. But if you're squinting down and you're looking at the shapes that are happening in, inside that glass. And, and the other thing I like to say is you're going to tell the truth but not the whole truth. Like, I don't have to come in here and do every single little, um, every single little stem of, this, um, of these flowers for your mind to know that that is, those are flower stems. You know, we fill in the blank, just like Vermeer's girl with the pearl earring. If you look at that pearl earring, there's not a whole lot to it other than a little dot of light, and it starts to read. So even, even just that little bit that I've done is, is reading stem. So don't let yourself, if, if you are trying to paint and you start to say, oh, I don't know to paint brass or glass, or mountains or trees, just shut yourself up <laughs> and start think, start looking for shapes. So right now, I am looking for this sort of, I see these kind of purple shapes. Weaving in and out and around and down on the bottom. Let's see.
see a nice big purple. Well, let's see. Do I want to do that? Yeah, there's a purple shape of the um, shadow down here that connects with what's happening inside the vase. Oh, and it turns when it comes over here, light is bouncing onto the side of this watermelon and it's making that the, the hue of this shadow take on some pink. So I can adjust that. And I see some of that watermelon color is coming into the pot. I see a nice ping of it right here. And y'all, I am squinting, 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 squinting. Squinting helps you simplify shape and see that form. All right, I want to get that blue stripe in there because when I set up the still life, I set it up thinking about how I'm going to use this stripe and this tea towel. In fact, I bought this tea towel because of its stripe, because of the white and the blue, because I know how, how nice shadows look on white surfaces outdoors, especially on blue sky days. And I knew I could use this stripe in my composition. Because what's the main squeeze of this painting? It's, it's this still life. Even the little watermelon is sort of contributing to and having a conversation with this still life. Well, and, and, so and also that stripe gives you a really nice angle to mm -hmm. kind of keep that angular feel going. Right, right, right. Gives it more energy when you have an angle. Yeah. So I see something that I'm going to want to change, and that is that this angle and this angle are the same. So one of those is going to change, and it's going to be this one. So yep. when I start going in and cutting in my negative shape, that means the shape around the object, with my heavy whites, I will do some editing there. All right. Yeah, so we can watch that, wait for that to come. So now we have light is bouncing off of this white tea towel, hitting the bottom of this watermelon, and now the shadow color is taking on a lot of green down here. So where the shadow color turned pink over here and it's bluer over here, all of that is the way um, our primary, secondary, and reflected light sources are playing with that white, white table. And by the way, those are all things that I go into detail on on my Streamline video, um, color magic for plein air painting. Well, I'll put it on the screen real quickly. There it is. Yeah. Fabulous uh, use of color. It's something you really should see because Susie knows how to nail it. Yeah, go I go a lot. Tube, just go to painttube.tv and search Susie Baker. Yeah, I give you guys a lot of information so that you can start understanding what it is that you're seeing. Okay, so I have just mixed up a nice little pile of kind of a, oh, I'm, I'm sort of co-mingling a cool a cool blue, I wonder if you can see that. In there, I've got some cool blue and some warm things sort of not fully mixed on my brush. And I'm gonna, there's some nice negative shapes in here that I'm gonna go and again, at a squint, looking for some shapes to define um, these stems. I've hardly switched brushes throughout this whole process. See, and already you're starting to feel the um, the form of this of this vase. I think I'll go get a grab a little bit of a smaller brush. This is another hog bristle brush, um, a little bit smaller. It's a filbert, going into that same little pile and looking for some of these smaller little shape. I'm y'all, I'm just looking at shape and color, putting it into place. There's a neat little sort of rim.
See some darker things down here. I think of uh, one of the analogies I like to make is when you're when you're watching somebody um, paint an oil painting and they make it look easy. It reminds me of when I was a little girl watching um, ice skaters at the Olympics and they're just smiling and they just make it look so easy and you think, oh, I want to do that, you know, and <laughs> but boy, when you strap on your skates for the first time or when you get outside with your first, um, you know, when you first start painting, you've realized that, man, there's a lot of things that those ice skaters did and a lot of the practice that they did to make it look that easy. So, uh, you know, give yourself a break and give yourself time to practice. And you're fa at least you're not falling on the ice. Yeah, <laughs> I did get a nice cut lip when I was a kid um, ice skating and somebody that was much better with skating backwards and bonked into me. So. Yeah, yeah, but when you're painting, you know, what's the worst that can happen? You're still having fun. Yeah, you're going to get some bug bites, feel a little hot sometimes. <laughs> okay, so I am going to, I have pre-mixed some big piles of, um, of light colors down here. So I'm going to go ahead and edit, the, edit that background like I was talking about. Um, boo -boo -boo. Might be too warm. So there's this concept of called broken color in painting, and that's where you see Monet, of course, did it a lot, where he would take two colors of the same value and juxtapose them side by side. Um, particularly pleasing when they are complementary colors like an orange or a blue, uh, yellow and purple. Um, and you can even do that with your paint like I was showing earlier where you don't quite mix your all of your paint together. So here's an opportunity too. So I have kind of the end of my table and the beginning of my background and it's coming to a point in this say at one thing. And that's kind of a design no-no. So we're gonna change that. Go to a little bit of a smaller brush. So would you address this idea of putting a little color in your white? Yeah, so um, like we know that that's a white tea ta towel and a white table. And um, our brain, when you're painting a, a white house, your brain oftentimes messes you up because your brain thinks, oh, that's probably a Sherwin-Williams Dover white. And so we will go to our titanium white because our brain is telling us it's white. And we paint that white house white. But that white house probably has a lot of reflected color in it. And, um, and so if there is a little green from the grass bouncing up into the white house, then your white is going to take on to some green. And so, so that is something that we can see by observation. But then when you paint more and you realize that it's going to be much more interesting and pleasing if I warm up this white. Um, instead of just painting it pure white. Or if I make the, towel, the table warm, and then when I come into the area where the tea towel is, if maybe I cool that down a little bit, so that when the tea towel sort of turns into the warm table, there's a little shift in the temperature of my color, warmer to cooler, that implies the edge of that tea towel, but doesn't make a super hard edge. So, um, you know, I think when we first start painting, you know, we tend to rely a little too heavily on straight from the tube white, and then we don't have anywhere to go um, when we want something to get lighter. 
kind of talking in circles here. I hope this. I had an instructor sense. tell me that there's never a moment that you use straight from the tube white. I have not found that to be true. I think there are times when I want to put a highlight on or something, but mm -hmm. usually you're going to bring it down a notch because you, you know, you're only talking about 10 values from light to dark where in, in nature, there's hundreds of values probably mm -hmm. you know, the sun, the intensity of the sun cannot be, can be, cannot be uh, replicated in paint. So you have to fake it. Right. Yeah. And, um, and when you're, and you also have the white of your canvas too. You can, um, you can let that white of your canvas show through. Like I don't necessarily need to paint every bit of that. I can let some of that be my table. Yep. So why not warm up or cool down my white? Um, I'm using primarily um, Michael Harding paint and they've got a nice warm white. Um, so you can even, give yourself a shortcut and squeeze out warm whites and cool whites um, to use. I think, so my little watermelon over there is a um, seedless watermelon, but you know, we know, you know, that there are seeds in watermelon. So why not, why not give us a few? <laughs> Um, okay, let's see. So now I want to get back up into some of the, the things, some of the little reflections in my glass. So I'm not really painting glass. I'm painting shape and color, right? Shape and color. Okay, and somebody needs down. to type that in the comments. Shape and Shape and color. So, yeah. In fact, if you um, wrote on your easel, shape and color shape and color there's a lot of kind of orange appearing in here because i have a i have um sort of a herringbone flag flag uh what do you call that not flagstone it's a little brick patio so some of that warmth is coming up into this giving me some shape and color to play on I kind of love painting um, flowers and glass for this very reason of all of these little fun, um, fun little reflections and opportunities. Okay, let's get, uh, I'm missing, I don't know how much time we have here, but I'm missing the interior of my sunflower. You've got plenty of time. Oh, good. Well, I will just keep working. Okay, so squinting down. And one of the nice things about painting sunflowers, again, is because they're, they're really, they, they make the shapes for you. So I'm looking at, that's too blue. Okay. So how does the negative shape of this dark interior start to define petals. So I've sort of overpainted my yellow, meaning I've painted more than I need. And now I have an opportunity to come in and kind of cut out a petal using negative shape. And then I see that the interior, oh, I can go back to my loaded yellow brush that's still sitting here into my big pile of um, that warm yellow that I made for the uh, sunflower. And in that same pile, I don't know if you can see that. You can't exactly. Let me tilt the, let me tilt my screen down just a little bit. All right, works. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you can see I've got a little mother pile of color here. Whoops, I went to the wrong brush. I have a little mother pile of color there. So I can see right on my palette how I'm shifting that, that yellow into a darker. Not quite dark enough. Let's go to some alizarin. I was using um, 
transparent red oxide. Okay, still at a squint, the shadow side of those sunflower leaves. Not leaves, petals. If they're green, they're leaves. If they're colored, they're petals. Yeah, is that the, that's the rule, huh? I don't know. I mean, it just seems like that. Yeah. Okay, and let's let's mix a lighter one. I love um, Michael Harding has these uh, Indian yellow colors. There's Indian yellow and Indian yellow red shade, and it's a um, a hue, which means that it doesn't have. Um, it's very transparent. And so when you mix Indian yellow with your color, you're not really um, shifting the value too much. You're just shifting the hue. And um, it's kind of like liquid sunshine. I think, I think I'll, um, have, I'll invite Michael to come onto the show and just do some, do some paint demo. Yeah, talk, talk, talk paint. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much we can know about, and the more you paint, um, you know, there's so much value to limiting your um, limiting your palette until you really know those colors, and then you start to learn the nature of color the more you paint, and the nature of what your your paints are going to do for you, and that's why there's not just a whole lot of shortcuts. Um, you know, the more we do, what are they, the 10,000 hour rule, Malcolm Gladwell's, um, you know, book that you just, you got to put in the time. Okay, I'm going to go into my background some because my whole background is actually pretty dark that I'm seeing. And if I can start, um, I'm gonna, I see it as reading kind of purple. You guys are a little offset from what I'm seeing, but um if I go in there and start putting in my background, let's see, I think I mixed this too light. Yep, I did. Mm, purpler. I also have this medium that I really like. It's called um, Marage Medium. It's spelled Mirager. I don't know if you can see that. But kind of hard to see, but yes. Yeah, it's it spells like Mirager, Italian formula. And it's made by a, a fellow artist, um, Andre Lucero. And um, he makes it himself, so I really like, you know, recommending it because you're supporting the, the artist, right, the little guy. And um, I like it because it sort of incre increases flow and it increases, um, speeds up the dry time, which is really nice for plein air painting. Um, but then it also, you know how when you've painted for a while and um, your paintings start to sink in, uh, meaning some, some places look kind of flat, whoops, while other ones look still wet and juicy, the Merge medium keeps things looking kind of shiny even when they, they start to dry, so. Generally, also in oil painting, you work dark to light. Um, so this is me sort of taking some dark paint and cutting into some light areas. So when you do that, you have to have a nicely loaded brush. Um, you think about when you have um, your painting sort of trees against sky and you've worked on your whole painting and then you um, you come back into, usually it's at the end of a painting, and you're going to come in, you're going to put that sky, 
and you start getting a lot of mud in the sky, um, the way to deal with that is, one, probably cleaning off your palette and giving yourself a nice clean palette of clean color to deal with. And then two is having a nicely loaded brush. Sometimes um, I, I had a, a teacher um, that I took workshops from, Clayton Beck, and he, he pointed out that, that people do this. We make this area between the thing and the thing that touches it, and he calls that the halo of fear. <laughs> Yeah, isn't that funny? And so because we're not quite sure what to do, so we leave this little halo around it when what we need to do is go ahead and commit, just like with that stroke. But see, I picked up a little bit of yellow in my brush. So I've got to sort of take that off, go back into my big pile of paint so that now I have another um, clean bit of color. Because if I pick up some of that yellow and I carry on scrubbing it into the background, then I, just like with our sky and trees, you're going to, um, yeah, you're going to pollute and muddy your sky. So, halo of fear. <laughs> halo of fear. Yeah, don't, yeah. You know, if you do it, I mean, you can do it as long as you're being intentional about it, if you know you're going to come back and, and put something there. Okay, I see some dark greens. This is just the story of painting, you know, is that you, you look for those shapes in the right color in the right place. And then my idea about, are you telling the truth but not the whole truth? Like, I don't have to tell you every single petal for you to read that as a sunflower. So I see um, I've got some little wispy things up here that I can just kind of start to indicate that tell you that something's going on up there. But I don't really have to, to come in here and, um, you know, paint a photorealistic painting. Um, that's just me scratching away with the end of my brush. Uh, let's see. Oop, I don't have this brush out. Oop. There is a, a rosemary brush that I really, really like. It's called a dagger. It kind of looks like that. This one has been around the block a few times, but um, it's it's great for its versatility and making little little shapes. Getting some of my lights. I see some light bits in there in that water. Mm -hmm. That was fun. It's all fun. Yeah. Unless you have to scrape it down. <laughs> well, and when know. you have to do that, you know you've learned something. I am. Um, I worked. I worked a long time on a little dogwood painting the other day that I just thought this is not doing what I want it to do. And I just scraped it. Yep. Yep. Well, I was out a, painting uh, this weekend and I, you know, the light, it was, it was raining, then it was not raining, then it was raining and the light was just, just driving me nuts. And I kept changing and finally just scraped. Yeah. That's cathartic sometimes, you know, just giving yourself permission to just, okay, I learned something. I'm scraping on to the next. Sometimes you you uh, you end up painting with friends and you paint a scene that you don't really want to paint because you're not inspired, but you want to kind of hang out with them. And mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. then it's like, eh, I'm not I'm just not feeling it. Yeah, that's OK. Yep. I had a, a painting that I did. I started in Telluride and this is a number of years ago and. I didn't like it, so I scraped it mostly down. You know, when you scrape, you don't always get everything gone. And then I went to Easton, and I tried something else with it, and I wasn't happy with that either. And so I scraped it again, and then I brought it to Door County and did a painting that I was really happy with. <laughs> you know, so it's like, isn't it funny sometimes where the, the panel is, is more valuable to you than the painting itself? <laughs> so, yeah, you just... 
keep trying. And it ended up making a really nice background, you know, of something that I could sort of build on and ended up with something I was really, really happy with. So sometimes deconstructing know. actually makes things better too. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Okay, I don't know how much of this, I mean, at this point, so I'm sort of sitting down and working on this just so that I could be set up um, consistently for the demo. And um, I don't, I probably at this point, I would start backing away more. Right. It's almost like at this point, um, you guys looking at it on screen are probably seeing some really obvious do you see anything really obvious that needs to be addressed? Not that I can tell, that, no. That I can't see because I'm too close? No. Um, yeah, you know, that. what did they, you know, John Singer Sargent, they said he had sort of a rut in the canvas behind him because he did so much backing up. And, you know, backing away and seeing things, sometimes flipping things upside down, looking at them in a mirror, it gives you that, uh, you know, literally different perspective where you start seeing things that are problematic that you can then adjust so well i think we got the great uh the great essence of this today why don't you come back on on screen and we'll say goodbye okay i can do that <laughs> hey hey all right that was well, fun the other yeah. the other thing that, that's really hard is you were painting in direct sunlight so your palette mm. was in direct sunlight and your painting was which is yeah. typically a no-no, but you had to do that for the camera. So that's, yep. that's tough, but you did a great job today. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. We'll see what it looks like when I get it inside. I'm sure I'll do a little bit of refining. So. All right, well, we're gonna put your website in the uh, comments section and also, of course, your new video, or your not new video, but it's new to some people, uh, Color Magic, which is really wonderful. You are, uh, quite an inspiration. You've done such a great job with your career and your painting and watching what's been happening to you over the past few years. You're just soaring like an eagle. Mm. You know, I, a lot of times I had a recent Instagram post, follow me on Instagram, y'all, um, where I just love my job. I was painting with Allison Menke. We were at painting a waterfall and, you know, you just have to pinch yourself sometime that I get to do this with my life. Um, I'm very grateful, um, grateful for all the doors that have been opened and, and things that I've been able to walk through and, and pick up. So um, thanks. Thanks to yeah. everyone who lets me do this. <laughs> so what are you going to do at the convention? Um, at the plein air convention? Yeah. I will be, I will be digging in even more into why you should be painting a plein air still life outdoors, what all the benefits of that. I will have some slides for you, um, show you example. I will show you the piece that um, got messed up in Telluride, messed up in Easton, and ended up becoming something. I'll make sure I put that in my slide. Um, just, you know, because it's inspiring when you see people that are um, out there doing it for a living, and, you know, we mess up too and have to make uh you know have to make something from nothing lemons from lemonade yeah, so that was a really that's what good I'm gonna be doing. i was on the phone with richard schmidt one day and he was telling me about he how he messed up this one painting and i thought you know that's really good to know that that mm. still happens to, to even somebody like that yeah yeah for sure we're all just in process you know we're all growing that uh, what did uh, there's a, a Japanese artist Hozukai who did uh, you know the 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 big wave paintings over Mount Fuji, and he said uh, he had this really entertaining quote uh, that essentially ended when I am 115 I shall really have come a long way you know I have finally every paint every little line and dot will be imbued with excellence you know but. He, uh, he kind of, you know, tongue in cheek, he was saying that, but it just goes to that point of, we have so much to learn, so much to grow. There's always well, going to be something challenging. And it keeps us young and it keeps us inspired, which is really wonderful. Yep. Keeps that brain young. Absolutely. That's what well, I'm thank counting you, on. Susie Baker, and, <laughs> and we really appreciate you coming on today. And I encourage everybody to, to uh, visit the OPA convention. Obviously, visit yep. Susie at the Plein Air Convention. Get Susie's video at, at paint tube.tv. Just search Susie Baker. Susie, thank you so much.